to the biology honors lecture on population ecology. Population ecology deals with the study of a biological population. Now, what is a biological population? Biological populations are the uh, groups of animals of the same species that live in the same area. So if we look at this picture down here, we have several different trees down here that are the same species. Maybe this one here. So this is a population of this species of tree in the Grand Canyon. You have different other species of plants down here, scrub and so forth, and so that would be a separate population. So within one ecosystem you might have several populations. Right, so population growth is affected by several different things. Of course resources are a major thing. Things like food, water, nutrients, so forth. Also disease limits your population growth. And then uh, damages to habitat through uh, either natural means or man-made means. So if the effect is negative, population growth stops or reverses, and if the effect is positive, then growth increases. So for example, if we look at population growth graphs, we have two graphs here. The first one is exponential growth. Exponential growth is when a population grows at a steady rate. And what we see here is this J-shaped curve. And this is a classic example of exponential growth. And the other type of growth is what we call logistic growth here. And logistic growth has an S-shaped curve. And the, w the way it works is that the population grows at first exponentially. So this part of the graph down here is all exponentially. And then after a while, something starts acting on the population and flattens it out. And so this is logistic growth. Now when we look at population growth and we have an equation, it's population growth equals births plus the immigration. Immigration is what's coming into your population. Then minus deaths and immigration. Immigration is what's going out of your population. Now we can also talk about population density. Population density is a number where we look at the number of organisms or no number of individuals of a population per unit area. So that could be the number of deer in a uh, forest that's 100 kilometers squared. So it's population density, number of individuals per unit area. So this is the equation down here. It's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, so for an example here, what is the population density of 500 people in a 100 kilometer square area? Just take 500 people divided by 1,000 kilometers square, and you get 5 people per kilometer square. And that's the population density of that particular human population. Now, what are some of the factors that affect population density? There are two types. There are density-dependent factors, and these are factors that limit the, the density of the population when the population increases. So for example, food, water, shelter, these kind of things would be uh, uh, things that limit the population as it gets bigger. So those would be density dependent factors. The other type is density independent factor. A density independent factor affects the population no matter its size. These are typically things like uh, natural disasters uh, and things that, that don't depend on the actual population number. For example, uh, this are a group of elk, a population of elk down here, and uh, a density dependent factor for them could be the amount of grass or forage that they have in, in their particular habitat. And if that runs low, then their density goes down. If it runs high, we have a very good year, there's lots of rain, there's, so there's lots of forage, lots of grass for them, then their population goes up in that particular area and the population density increases. Now, a independent factor would be something like a forest fire. Now, a forest fire is going to cause their population to drop no matter what size the population is. So this is a density independent factor. Now, as we saw in that J-shaped curve, uh, that is a continuously growing population. However, no population can continuously grow exponentially. It just doesn't happen, especially in nature there's usually some kind of environmental factor that gets in the way that starts to limit that population's growth and we call those limiting factors. 
So a limiting factor is any condition. It could be an abiotic factor. It could be a biotic factor. It could be density independent. It could be density dependent. And these things limit the actual growth of the population. They are called limiting factors. Space is one. Disease. Uh, the more dense uh, a population is, typically the higher chance of spreading disease. So that would be a density dependent factor. And then availability of food, of course, is a big one as well, as well as water. One way you can look at that is uh, how limiting factors affect a population is by looking at uh, the barrel analogy, which is this part right here. This is a barrel. And the barrel is made up of slats. And so here's a slat, here's a slat, and so forth. And inside the barrel, you have your population. So this is your population. The water simulates your population. And then for your population, there are several limiting factors. So light is a limiting factor, heat, mechanical support, organic matter, phosphorus, potassium, and so forth. All these things are possible limiting factors to your population. For this particular pop population, potassium right here is our limiting factor. And so the water level in this barrel can only go as high as your potassium level. Even though nitrogen is higher, other nutrients are higher here, water is very high, and so forth. Now, if something goes down, for example, we have a drought, and the water then goes way down to here, then what happens is that water then becomes a limiting factor because it now is lower than potassium for the population. So our population would drop at that point down to the water level. So this is a limiting factor and how it affects the population. Now we said that no population can grow exponentially and it eventually reaches a plateau. This plateau is called the carrying capacity of uh, that particular ecosystem for that particular species. So it's the number of the, or number of the organisms the environment can maintain. So here we have our J-shaped curve again, right in this area, that's our exponential growth. However, some kind of limiting factor affects the curve right in this area and our population levels off. And even though our population has a level here, it might fluctuate between that off and on. But uh, basically, the population will never get any higher than this because of the limiting factors that maintain the population at that level. So as I said, no population continue growing exponentially. Eventually, this will happen even for the human population. All right. Now, when we talk about populations, these groups of animals, they have a specific role in their environment. We call this role their niche. So a niche is what their job in the environment. It is also where they live in their environment, how much water it takes to keep them alive, how much food, um, and it contains the habitat. Now, habitat is not a niche. Habitat is the actual just living space where the animal lives. But the niche includes that as well as the role of the organism. For example, if we look down here at this um, particular picture here, this is um, a fungi here, and this fungi's niche is to decompose this log. And that's its role. It's a decomposer. But it has a habitat that lives in this forest where this log is. And it has so much water and so much sunlight and um, other nutrients that it needs in order to survive and break that log down to do its job. So the niche is all of that stuff along with its role of a decomposer. One thing to remember is that no two species can occupy the same niche. However, they can occupy the same habitat. So you can't have a different type of decomposer decomposing the same log at the same time. If you do that, then you get what we call competition. When two or more species compete for the same limited resource, we get what we call interspecific competition. Basically, this helps uh, limit growth. For example, we have uh, an ibex here and we have a zebra here. And these two species live in the same savanna area. They compete for the same grass that you have down in this area. And so they will compete together. And sometimes the ibex will outcompete the zebra, and sometimes the zebra will outcompete the ibex. But there is a competition between them for this same limited food source. Other types of competition include a predator prey relationship. A predator prey relationship is when you have predation happening. So we have this lynx that is preying upon a snowshoe hare here in this picture. 
And so this type of competition is also known as predation. And what we see if we graph their populations, their predators and a prey's populations, what we see is that obviously the prey is going to have a higher population than the predators, the first thing you see. But also what you see is that as the population of the prey spikes up, the predator slowly follows afterwards and then it spikes up. When we have too many predators, then that drops our prey very drastically. And then our predators drop because of the lower amount of prey. So you see this cyclic up and down, the up part here and the down part here for the prey, between the predator and the prey. And this is a classic example of how predators and prey uh, compete uh, against each other. They're constantly finding new ways for example, the pads on the lynx's feet down here help them get through the thick snow. And then the color of the coat of the hair also helps it blend in. So we have this back and forth between the predator and the prey all of the time. I hope this clears up any misconceptions you have about population dynamics.